All right, so let's uh, let's pick back up um, talking about these things called resistance networks and the thermal resistance analogy for conduction problems. Um, we're going to work a couple examples uh, using this idea of thermal resistance, and then we'll segue on into the idea of extended surfaces or fins, um, which we'll try to wrap up on Wednesday. So. Um, just to quickly recap, okay, what we're talking about when discussing thermal resistance, right? The idea is that a some object through which conduction is occurring can be treated in a way that's very analogous to an electrical resistor. So if we say that we have some temperature one, some temperature two. Um, and then in between them is some object with a thermal resist or a thermal conductivity K, we can instead say that that object has some thermal resistance R. Um, so the idea here is if the T1 is higher than T2, we're going to have heat flow from left to right. In that heat flow, we'll have a magnitude of Q equal to T1 minus T2 over that thermal resistance. So it's very similar to the way we use Ohm's law, right, to calculate current in relationship to a voltage potential difference and an electrical resistance, almost identical way. Um, likewise, we have we could we could draw the heat flux or write the heat flux in the x direction here as T1 minus T2 over the flux resistance, and the only difference between these would be. T1 minus T2 over R times the area of whatever we're uh, considering conduction to occur through. Um, so if we consider a plain wall, right, this is the example we talked about so far. Let's say it has some thickness L1, it has some thermal conductivity uh, K1. And it has some surface area A. Okay. We would write that the thermal resistance is one over or sorry, L over K A. Right? Or that the flux resistance is just L over K. And this makes sense, right? This is essentially um, for for uh, a steady heat conduction through a wall without any heat generation, okay, if we were to apply this expression right here, T1, T1 minus T2 over R, that would be T1 minus T2 times Ka over L. That essentially works out to Fourier's law, right, for one-dimensional conduction. That's our solution to the 1D heat, uh, heat equation without heat generation. So that brings us to the point that Thermal resistance, this analogy, right? Is valid for steady one dimensional and no heat generation. Okay, if we have that Q dot term in a body then we cannot treat it as a thermal resistor. The same way that in an electrical circuit, we can't measure the current across some resistor based on just the voltage drop if there's some current source in the middle of that resistor. All right. um, so composite walls, what happens if we stack right, another wall onto the side of this one? This one with a different thermal conductivity K2, maybe a different length L2. Okay. So if this is T1, this is T2, we'll say over here is T3. The beauty of the thermal resistance analogy is that 
just as in electrical circuits, we can treat these as thermal resistors in series. So we simply stack those on top of each other. We say T1, T2, T3. This one will have some thermal resistance L1 over K1A. This will have a thermal resistance R2, the L2 for K2A. All right, this is assuming that they both have the same surface area. And that means that our total resistance is equal to just R1 plus R2, which is going to be equal to T1 minus T3 over Q. So this is where we see the thermal resistance analogy used most often is when we have these stacks of so-called composite walls where we have the heat flowing, right, the Q remains constant as it travels through the wall. And so we can simply add up each individual temperature drop and treat it as, right, one system overall. So the temperature will drop from one to two, and it'll drop further from two to three. Um, and so what this allows us to do is to judge that bulk temperature drop or, uh, in relation to the total heat flow through the wall but it doesn't give us the detailed insight into what exactly the temperature distribution in the wall is. So that is the trade-off here. Okay, so um, at the conclusion of last lecture, right, we were talking about this example uh, of cooling in a high temperature stage of a gas turbine. Okay, so what we said is there's hot gas, right, uh, combustion gas, flowing across a turbine blade uh, at a super high temperature. In this case, we said 1,700 Kelvin, all right? Nearly four, or over 1,400 degrees Celsius um, with a convective heat transfer coefficient of 1,000 watt per meter squared Kelvin. And to avoid melting the blades into a puddle of useless non-turbines, the idea is A, run cooling air through the inside of the blades at some reduced temperature, in this case, uh, only 400 Kelvin, uh, with a heat transfer coefficient that's only about half. Uh, and additionally, put a layer of a less conductive, what's called thermal, uh, thermal boundary coating or thermal barrier coating onto the outside of the blade. A very thin layer of a ceramic material we call zirconia, uh, which has a very low uh, thermal conductivity. It's only about 1.3 watts per meter Kelvin. Um, so, here's the question. If we take our blade, we've got convective cooling out here, convective heating out here, we've got a layer of zirconia, we have a bonding agent layer, right, which contributes some additional thermal resistance, and then we have the actual material of our hollow blade. If we go ahead and take all this into account, are we going to melt the blade? Um, so using the plain wall approximation, right, we're going to sort of unwrap this blade and treat it as if it's a straight wall. We're not going to account for curvature. Uh, so what we did last time was we said, here's our sort of our diagram. We've got our blade, we've got this bonding material, and we have our insulating zirconia out here. So we've gone ahead and labeled surface temperature 1, this intermediate temperature T2, and the blade temperature TS3 at the inside where it's being cooled by that air that flows through the inside of the blade. Um, and so our equivalent resistance network, right, was essentially just a matter of drawing, again, the series resistor analogy. We said that to assume we have, right, our hot gas at T outside. We have the thermal resistance that is a model of our convection, okay, here that gets us to TS1. We have the thermal resistance that is uh, due to conduction in this zirconia layer here, this TBC, or thermal barrier coating. We have an additional resistance that is, um, let me draw that a little more clearly, 
Um, we have that additional resistance, which is due to this bonding layer, right? And we haven't been told anything about you know the thermal conductivity of the bonding layer or the temperature drop across the bonding layer. What we've been told is simply here's what the thermal resistance is per unit area, right? So we're just going to essentially take that number and plug it in here. Okay, we're not going to worry about the details of what goes on in the middle. Um, then we have the thermal resistance of the material and the blade. Okay, that gets us to TS3. And then finally, here's the convective cooling resistance that gets us to T infinity I, or T infinity inside. So one of the things to note here is that right, we are missing A. We don't have any knowledge about the area of the blade. So instead of using instead of using R, right, we're going to be scrapping that in favor of R prime, which is T right, T1 minus T2 over Q prime or Q double prime. So we're going to be doing this in a heat flux, right, or heat transfer per unit area context. So let's start looking at what these individual resistance numbers are going to be. Okay. So we've got, let's say, let's call this uh, R C O. Let's call this R T B C. Call this R B. R. The R B stands for R bond. We'll have R blade. We'll have R C I. So we've got convective resistance at the outside, thermal barrier coating resistance, bond resistance, blade resistance, convective resistance at the inside. So or rather, double primes on all of these, I should say. So the convective resistance at the outside is simply equal to 1 over H at the outside equals 1 over 1,000 watts per meter squared Kelvin, or 10 to the negative third meters squared Kelvin per watt. Our TVC, this just works out to the thermal resistance of a plan wall. So this will be L TVC over K TVC, which works out to right, half a millimeter, so 0 0.0005 meters over 1.3 watts per meter Kelvin. So this works out to 3.85 times 10 to the negative fourth meters squared Kelvin per watt. Our double prime B, or the bond resistance, is actually given to us as part of the problem. In this case, oops. Whoa, where'd that? Um, if we go back here, this bond resistance should have put a double prime on there. Ten uh, to the negative fourth. In this case, one over a. Uh, I should have. Never mind. Let's remove that double prime because I include the one over a. So this means that our double prime of the bond is equal to ten to the negative fourth meter squared Kelvin per watt. So we'll plug that in here. 10 to the negative fourth meter squared Kelvin per watt. I'm going to go and underline each of these numbers. Our double prime, the blade. Again, this is just the thermal resistance of plane wall, this time with the K and the thickness of the blade material. 
that inconel, right? So this turns into L blade over K blade, which is 0 0.005 meters, so it's five millimeters thick, and it has a thermal conductivity of 25 watts per meter Kelvin, so this works out to two times 10 to the negative fourth meter squared Kelvin per watt. And finally, our convective at the inside. So this is the convection resistance for the cooling air. And this is one over HI, or one over 500 watts per meter squared Kelvin. It gives us a final value of two times 10 to the negative fifth meter squared Kelvin per watt. All right. So this has just been bookkeeping so far. Like we, we haven't we haven't done anything crazy. We've just been um, plugging numbers that were given to us into these expressions for thermal resistance. Um, and next, all we have to do is add these values up, right? So um, if we say that, right, R total then is equal to, right, that R, or sorry, R prime, double prime total equal to the outside convective resistance plus R double prime to TBC plus R double prime of that bond coating plus R double prime of the blade plus R double prime of the convective cooling at the inside and we just plug in these values that we have right here. This works out to 10 to negative third plus 3.85 times 10, oops, 85 times 10 to the negative fourth plus 10 to the negative fourth plus two times 10 to the negative fourth uh, plus did I get that right? This is supposed to be a negative three. Yep, two times 10 to the negative three. Um, and then this is all meters squared Kelvin per watt. So this works out to 3.69 times 10 to the negative third meter squared Kelvin per watt. Okay, and so what we've done is we've taken, if we have our, our hot air out here, and our cold air over here, so we've got T infinity I, we've got T infinity O, we're Assuming that the temperature distribution is going to look something like this, right? Some linear drop across here, some drop across that thermal barrier or that, that bond, and then some drop across the blade. And let's go ahead and move this down. T infinity I. And so rather than solving right, the heat equation inside each of these members and using a bunch of boundary conditions to solve for our unknowns, we can simply say that the total heat flow from this side, right, from the hot gas on this side through the blade and everything is equal to Q prime is equal to T infinity outside minus T infinity inside over our double prime total. So this is going to work out to 1700 Kelvin minus 400 Kelvin all over is 3.69 times 10 to the negative third 
meter squared Kelvin per watt, or 3.52 times 10 to the fifth watts per meter squared. So there's our heat flux that's being pushed through the blade, right? With that, or being pushed through the thermal barrier coating, that bonding layer, and the blade as a result of the convective heating on one side and convective cooling on the other. So it's, it, it really is that the, the analogy between this and the electrical resistance couldn't get any more elegant because it's just like the way that a voltage potential pushes current through. Okay. In this case, a temperature difference pushes heat through. So, um, but the question was, right, are we going to melt the blade? So this doesn't answer that. This just tells us how many watts of a thermal energy per unit area are being shoved through the blade by this temperature difference. So to s find the surface temperatures, right, namely, we're interested, so let me redraw that really quickly. Got Rather, this is going to look like this. Um, so what we're interested in, right, are the temperatures in the blade itself. So here's our thermal barrier coating, and here's the blade. Obviously, the higher temperature in the blade is going to be right at that bonding layer um, where the heat enters the blade material. So if we call this... Um, what did we... What number did we send that? T2? Okay, so if this is TS3, this is T2 in here, and this is T infinity I. Question is, how do we find the surface temperatures? How do we find T2, TS3? We know T infinity sub I, right? That's given to us. It's 400 Kelvin. That's the temperature of the cooling air. Um, how to find... Intermediate temps. Anyone have any ideas? We've got Q double prime, right? We know how much heat is flowing through. Q double prime. Let's write that in black. Q double prime. And the x direction is equal to um, that 3.52 times 10 to the fifth watts per meter squared. We know we know H in the air, right? And we know K in the blade. Remember, this is constant, right? All of the Q that goes through the blade is going out into the air. So we can use Newton's law of cooling, right? Which tells us essentially um, you've got Newton's law of cooling says that Q um, double prime X is equal to H T S three minus T infinity I. Right. So with this known, this known, and this known, it's very easy to solve for the surface temperature of the blade. TS3 is equal to, in this case, T infinity I plus 1 over H Q double prime X, which equals 400 Kelvin plus 1 over 500 watts per meter squared Kelvin times 3.5. 5, 2 times 10 to the fifth watts per meter squared. Sorry, it's not a Kelvin. Um, another way we could have done this <coughs> is we know Q. We could have simply used another resistance analogy, dropped this convective resistance, 
right? And pretended that um, we could have we could have done something like this. Here's the convective heating resistance. Here's the TBC resistance. Here's that contact resistance. Here's the blade resistance, and then here's TS3, right? If we drop this convective resistance here, we already know Q double prime, and so if we find R total, kind of R total minus that convective cooling resistance, um, then it's very easy to find the temperature drop between this point and this point. Um, anyway, we'll, we'll go back to the um, way we were solving this. So here's TS3. Right? <clears throat> And then from TS3, we want to find T2. So again, we can go ahead and use Fourier's law, which says that Q double prime for a one-dimensional steady conduction problem with no generation, prime x is equal to negative K T2 minus T Oops, say TS3. And so we get that T2 is equal to TS3 plus, um, oh, sorry, this is going to be over L blade is equal to L blade um, let's tag this negative K with blade 2. L blade over K blade times Q double prime X, which works out to 1174 Kelvin. So, um, so again, I just want to call out attention to the fact that when we were working backwards, right, in both these cases, we were also, we could use this as the resistance analogy. We've got a 1 over H here, which is essentially our double prime of convection, and we've got L over K here, which is R double prime of the blade. So we simply said this temperature plus the temperature jump that results from pushing Q prime X, double prime X through that resistance. Um, so there's 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 multiple ways of kind of thinking about this problem, kenning this problem. Um, but what it works down to, or works out to, is use the thermal resistance concept to kind of shortcut the total temperature jump from one side to the other, or to shortcut figuring out how much total heat flux you have going through this composite wall, and then work backwards from there with a known heat flux. It becomes very easy to solve for the resulting temperature jumps across different layers. So you can use your known rate equations for Fourier's law of conduction, for Newton's law of cooling, or the Kelvin Helmholtz, sorry, um, yeah, law of uh, uh, radiation, okay, or Stefan Boltzmann law, rather, uh, law of, of uh, radiation, uh, you can quickly find the intermediate temperatures. So it seems a little counterintuitive. You find the end solution and you work back for the intermediate steps but it works very well, and it's a very easy process to apply. Um, all right, so a couple other little kickers to the resistance concept. Okay. There's this idea of contact resistance. All right. if you're, uh, when you have one of these composite walls, right? so you join two walls together, and say that this has some resistance one, this has some resistance two. If we were to take a look at the contact point between these walls, what we would see oops, is that these walls are not, right, they're not perfect. There's this region of sort of uh, surface imperfections and trapped air or trapped fluid and such between them, um, which creates 
if we were to look at the temperature distribution here, which creates a sort of a concentrated resistance because in between these you've got a reduced contact area as well as some convective um, heat transfer between these two solid objects. So it's true that anytime surfaces contacting one another have imperfect interfaces, which results in a very high resistance over a very short distance. Which is why you end up with this sort of pseudo jump in temperatures. Okay. Linear jump linear. Um, and as a rule, it's very hard to calculate what this contact resistance is going to be. It's sort of a um, something you have to look up in a table or use some empirical uh, knowledge of. But our contact, we'll go ahead and say, um, generally decreases as surfaces become smoother or the contact pressure increases. So you think of uh, if, you're, if you're pan frying steaks, for example, right? What's one of the, it's the kind of the cheater's method for getting them to cook faster? You push down on the steaks in the skillet. Right, to increase that heat transfer. It's the same idea here. Um, so if you look in your books, right, if you look at uh, like table 3.1, one of the uh, things you'll see in there is a list of materials with typical sort of surface finishes and then contact resistances for different contact pressures, okay, as well as if you have different sort of fluids filling the gap. So if you have air filling the gap versus if there's a vacuum between them versus if it's water in between the two. Right? All of these influence what that contact resistance is, but in ways that are really difficult to calculate directly, as I said. So turn to table 3.1 and others like it to look these sort of uh, values up. For, for example, um, if we're considering contact between two stainless steel plates. Uh, if they're being clamped together at a pressure of 100 kilopascals, which is basically one atmosphere, we end up with R double prime is equal to something between 6 and 25 times 10 to the negative fourth meters squared Kelvin per watt. And if you were to multiply that uh, clamping pressure by 100, that is move it up to 10 megapascals, or about 100 um, atmospheres of pressure, then R double prime is equal to 0 0.7 to 4 times 10 to the negative fourth meter squared Kelvin per watt. So one atmosphere, this is typical of a, oops, this is typical of a pretty moderate clamping force, right? The kind of thing you might get um, using like a mechanical C-clamp or something between two pieces of metal. Whereas if you were to use uh, nuts and bolts or a more industrial sort of clamping thing like a hydraulic press, uh, you could easily get up to 100 uh, atmospheres of clamping pressure. Um, and in doing so, you've reduced, just because you've squeezed all these surface imperfections together and increased the sort of contact area and minimized the amount of fluid trapped between those surfaces, <laughs> You've decreased the resistance by an order of magnitude. Yeah. What is it? Zero point seven times four. Uh, zero point seven two four. So it's a range. Oh. Yeah. So here's something in a range of six to twenty-five. Understand that you're four with them. Well, that's zero point seven to four. 
And there are more materials and more clamping pressures and more uh, configurations in table 3.1. So write that down and use that as a reference. Professor, yeah. How do we know um, when to account for this? Um, pretty much you'll be told. You know, if uh, in, 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 in practice, right, in, in real engineering problems, you always need to account for this, right? Anytime you have two things that are joined together in a way that does not make them like a, a, a kind of a monolithic structure. If you have something welded, that's one thing. In general, right, you weld two pieces of metal together, you've joined them into effectively one piece of material thermally, right? Um, sometimes welding, right, you introduce metal with a different conductivity, so you might need to treat it as a composite material, but uh, if you have things like bolted interfaces, okay, this is the sort of thing that you need to account for. Right? It's standard practice when coming up with uh, assembly calculations for anything that's bolted together. You figure out the bolt tension and the clamping pressure at that interface. You can use that information along with knowledge about what materials are being clamped together to come up with this sort of behavior. And then you just use that composite wall assumption to uh, figure out what kind of temperature drop or heat transfer you'll get through that interface. Um, all right, and last thing dealing with thermal resistance, right, is this idea of parallel resistance. So what happens in electrical circuits, right, when you have two resistors that are branched such that current flows through them together, it decreases the overall resistance of that leg of the circuit, right? Um, same thing happens in heat transfer. So if let's say we have some wall here, Got some area A1 and some surface temperature TS1. The whole thing has a thermal conductivity of K1. Um, let's say it is attached to another piece of metal here or another piece of material with K2. Let's say this is L1 thick, L2, and has surface area A2. And then let's say that there's um, like an adiabatic or a perfect insulating surface here. Uh, and the reason I'm, I'm putting that perfect insulation there is essentially to, um, to make sure that this still behaves as a one-dimensional heat transfer problem, that we don't have heat flowing in here and out through the surface, because that uh, screws with our um, assumption of one-dimensional heat transfer. Um, so what we then have is, let's say we've got fluid flowing through are flowing past both of these surfaces, right? So we have <coughs> convective cooling both at this surface and at this surface. So we've got T infinity and some H, all right? Um, so let's go ahead and uh, draw a equivalent thermal circuit here. We've got TS1. All the heat flows through this first wall to a branch where it flows in parallel through the conductive resistance of the second piece of material here. And then that convective resistance as it leaves um, by convective heat transfer out here through area A2. At the same time, through this wall, we have just convection. Okay. And then they both end up at T infinity. So let's call this R1, we'll call this R2, we'll call this RC3, uh, we'll call this RC4, right? where the subscript C means it's convective resistance. We've got R1 is equal to L1 over K1 a1, right? This is just straight from the table. R2, same thing, because it's conductive resistance in a plane wall, L2 over K2, A2. RC3 is equal to 1 over H, A3, or sorry, A2, rather. And RC4 is equal to 1 over HA3, where this is A3. Um, 
which is really just equal to one over h a one minus a two, right? Um, and so if we were to come up with the total thermal resistance of this whole thing, right? The idea is the same as in electrical circuits. You say these two are in series, add them up. Then this series uh, resistance is in parallel with this. So you take the reciprocal of each, add them together, and then take the reciprocal of that sum. Um, and then that whole thing is in series with this guy, so you simply add that. Um, so it works out to R total is equal to, in this case, R1 plus 1 over R um, C4 plus 1 over R2 plus R C3, negative 1. So R1 is in series with this parallel chunk. So RC4 here, and then this series um, of the R2 and RC3. So uh, again, this is, this is exactly the way we deal with electrical resistors. Um, if this is a little bit rusty for you, and how to come up with equivalent resistances, um, it's something you might want to practice a little bit uh, for your own sanity in this course, all right? So to kind of wrap up this idea of, like, to summarize, right, what we're talking about here, um, we've got, I should say, this is not just cylindrical and spherical walls. This is also plane walls and convective surfaces. Um, if we could fill in this table here, right, We've so far discovered that for um, that for plane walls, right, the total the resistance is L over K A, and the heat flux resistance then is L over K. If we were to look at cylindrical walls, we can sort of by inspection see how this works. So the heat rate, if this is equal to um, the quantity shown in this cell, we can see that here's our temperature jump. Okay. And so if the heat rate is equal to delta T over R, right, then this, everything that's being multiplied by that temperature jump is the reciprocal of our thermal resistance. So this works out to ln uh, oops, R2 over R1 over 2 pi L K. Same thing with a spherical wall. We've got our temperature jump here, and so we can see by inspection what the equivalent thermal resistance is. Just one over R1 minus one over R2, all over four pi K. And for a convective surface, right, the heat rate is given by Newton's law of cooling, which is Q equals A H delta T, basically, right? So the resistance is 1 over H A. All right, so the heat flux resistance, that is the, if we're instead talking, instead of talking about the heat rate, we're talking about the heat rate per unit area. Again, we've sort of dropped the direction because we're assuming this is all one dimensional and is always going, um, in this case, like in the X direction or in the R direction, if we're talking about the radial systems. Um, this works out to R times A, right? Because if we were to take Q double prime as Q divided by A, that A just finds its way into the R. So um, for a cylinder, right, the surface area is going to be 2 pi times the radius times the length of the cylinder. So if we were to put a 2 pi RL up top, um, then what it works out to be for the re thermal resistance or the flux resistance is R times the ln or R2 over R1 all over K. Same thing for the spherical wall. Again, here the surface area is going to be 4 pi R squared, right? So R2. 1 over R1 minus 1 R2 
Okay. And for the convective surface, regardless of whether it's a plane wall, a cylinder, or a sphere, right? whatever the surface area is, it's just going in here. And so when you're talking about the heat flux per unit surface area, it's going to be 1 over h. So make a table like this. Let this be your resource when forming these resistance networks because it becomes very quick, very easy to judge the amount of heat flow through these composite shells or composite walls using this sort of approach. Uh, so we're going to wrap up with, I think we're going to get to extended surfaces in the next lecture, but we're going to wrap up quickly with a, uh, a, a very fast example of tube insulation. Okay, so here's a radial system. Uh, we're going to assume that this tube here is carrying boiling water. Let's say it's a, um, say we're, we're looking at like steam radiators, right? Something that's carrying a saturated liquid or a saturated vapor. Um, and we're trying to get this to where it's going with a minimum of heat loss through this copper pipe. So we've got a uh, copper pipe uh, with a two centimeter inside diameter and a one millimeter wall thickness. Okay, so copper's got a thermal conductivity of 400 watts per meter Kelvin. We said that the air around the pipe is at 293 Kelvin or 20 degrees Celsius. Um, so the question is, what's the heat loss through a 10 meter long section of this pipe? If we say it has, yes, it has this uh, three, meter, or three centimeter thick rack of insulation, this blue layer, or without it. Um, and actually, looking at the time, I don't think we're going to have time to solve all of this, but let's set up the resistance network that we would use. So um, if we're talking about with insulation, right, we've got our inside fluid temperature, right, which um, because it's boiling, this was an example I used before, when you have a boiling liquid, this is a case where you generally get to say, that fixes the, the that 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 Im imposes a constant temperature condition on any surface touching it, because okay? phase change tends to absorb um, any extra heat transfer or provide any extra heat transfer um, necessary to keep something at a constant temperature. So here we can simply say that the inside temperature is going to be T S one of um, which is equal to that 373 Kelvin. So we've got TS1. We have the resistance of that first copper pipe layer, right? Then we have the resistance of, so we'll say this is the resistance of the copper pipe, and we have the resistance of the insulation, and then we have the convective resistance. To reach the outside air temperature. Okay. And without insulation, we've got the inside surface temperature, the copper pipe resistance, which is the same as the case above, and then we have the convective resistance of to get to T infinity. Um, are these two convective resistances going to be the same? No, because in one case, we've got this big old surface area right at the outside of the insulation. And on the other case, we have a much smaller surface area on the copper pipe. So what this sets up, and we'll, we'll wrap this up on Wednesday, is the case that if you don't design your insulation on like wraps on tubes correctly, what you can do is, sure, you, you minimize the amount of con conductive heat transfer. Right? You increase the conduction um, resistance but you actually will decrease the convective resistance even more. And so you can end up with greater heat transfer by wrapping a pipe in insulation. Uh, so we'll finish that up on Wednesday. The uh, homework three will be posted here in a couple of hours.